Imagine transforming this into this for over a century. That's exactly what Australia planned to do with its sun-scorched interior. Create a vast inland sea stretching 1,000 kilometers across the outback. Australia nearly spent $200 billion to create its own Mediterranean Sea in the middle of the desert, a project that would have changed the climate of an entire continent. Sounds like a scene from Mad Max Fury Road meets Waterworld. Interestingly, what many Australians don't realize is that an inland sea actually existed here once. The ancient Aromanga Sea covered much of central Australia 140 to 100 million years ago, home to prehistoric marine reptiles and giant ammonites. In a sense, these inland sea dreamers weren't creating something new. They were unconsciously trying to restore what nature once built. But here's the surprising part. Internal documents reveal this failed project has been secretly revived with cutting edge technology. And climate scientists now believe it might be Australia's only hope against its Achilles heel, catastrophic drought. The question is, would creating this sea save a continent or destroy it? Fast forward to the 1800s. European explorers like Charles Sturt trekked into Australia's red center, expecting to find a massive inland river or lake. Instead, they found deserts. Sturt wrote in his journal, I could not help thinking that some great convulsion had torn these regions asunder, but the idea of an inland sea never died. Enter John Bradfield, the Einstein of Australian engineering. In the 1930s, fresh off designing the Sydney Harbour Bridge, Bradfield proposed redirecting floodwaters from Queensland's tropical rivers into the Lake Eyre Basin, a depression 15 meters below sea level. His plan was a 2,300 kilometer network of dams, pumps, and canals to fill the basin, creating a sea larger than Belgium. Think of it as Australia's version of the Panama Canal, but instead of connecting oceans, it would terraform a desert. Bradfield argued this inland sea would cool the continent's climate, generate hydropower, and create farmland rivaling California's Central Valley. But here's the kicker, Lake Eyre already occasionally floods. Every decade or so, monsoonal rains from the north transform it into a temporary wetland. Bradfield's scheme aimed to make this permanent. Why the obsession with Lake Eyre in the first place? Let's break it down its mechanics. Australia's outback is a giant bathtub. The Lake Eyre Basin covers 1.2 million square kilometers, 17% of the continent. Its lowest point, Katie Thonda Lake Eyre, sits 15 meters below sea level. During rare floods, water rushes in from rivers like the Diamantina and Cooper Creek, filling the basin in a matter of weeks. But there's a catch. The basin is endorheic, meaning water flows in but doesn't flow out. In a wet year, Lake Eyre becomes a shimmering oasis. In dry years, a salt-crusted wasteland. To create a permanent sea, you'd need to overcome three hurdles. The first is water volume. Filling Lake Eyre requires 300 cubic kilometers of water, equivalent to 600 Sydney harbors. The second is evaporation. The outback's 40 degrees Celsius summers evaporate water 10 times faster than rainfall. And the third is salinity. Without an outlet, salt would accumulate, turning the sea into a dead sea down under on steroids. For perspective, the Caspian Sea, the world's largest inland sea, holds 78,000 cubic kilometers of water. Bradfield Sea would be 0.4% of that. Still, it's like trying to fill 12 billion Olympic pools in a desert. Bradfield's plan captivated Depression-era Australia. Politicians hailed it as a jobs bonanza. Farmers dreamed of irrigation. But by the 1940s, the scheme stalled. But why? The Bradfield scheme faced two stubborn opponents, physics and mathematics. Engineers calculated that evaporation would drain the sea faster than rivers could fill it. Even with Bradfield's canals, the basin would lose three meters of water annually, requiring perpetual refilling. 
the cost was estimated from $10 billion up to $200 billion. The project dwarfed the Sydney Harbour Bridge's budget. And finally, tampering with river systems threatened fragile ecosystems and indigenous communities reliant on them. Fast forward to the 1960s. The Soviet Union's Aral Sea Disaster, a cautionary tale of diverting rivers for agriculture, showed the risks. The Aral Sea shrank by 90%, creating toxic dust storms. Australia took note. By the 1970s, the Bradfield scheme was shelved, but the dream lingered. In 2020, a new proposal emerged, the Australian Inland Sea Project 2.0, this time powered by renewable energy. The plan was to use solar power desalination plants on the coast to pump seawater 600 kilometers inland. Supporters argue flooding the basin with salt water avoids evaporation as salt reduces water loss. A sea could boost rainfall via lake effect weather patterns, and solar energy makes it sustainable like. But critics fire back. The cost is $200 billion plus for pipelines alone. And the next problem is salinity. A saltwater sea would sterilize the soil, rendering agriculture impossible. And finally, indigenous rights. The Lake Air Basin is part of the Arabana people's ancestral land. Climate change adds urgency. Australia's droughts are intensifying. The 2019 to 2020 black summer saw entire towns run dry and a lot of people and animals suffered. Could an inland sea buffer against drought or would it be a band-aid on a bullet wound? No one knows. Do you guys even believe in climate change? Cause some of you flamed me even for mentioning climate change in the biggest dam in the world, the Three Gorges Dam video. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. If Australia built the Inland Sea tomorrow, here's what would happen. Within the first year, the basin would fill to 30% capacity, creating a shallow lake visible from space. By year three, salinity would reach critical levels turning the water turquoise. By year five, microclimate changes would begin with rainfall increasing by up to 15% within 100 kilometers. By year 10, coastal-like cities would develop around the shores, becoming Australia's newest real estate boom. By year 50, the ecosystem would either collapse due to hypersalinity or create a thriving new biosphere unlike anything in modern Australia. Here is what's interesting. Five million years ago, the Mediterranean Sea almost evaporated completely, and it was called the Mycenaean Salinity Crisis. Then the Atlantic burst through Gibraltar, refilling the basin in two years, and the result was a biodiversity explosion. Could Australia's inland sea trigger similar renewal? It's feasible. But as we've seen, the plan faces a complex web of challenges. The Mediterranean refilled naturally with seawater. Australia's scheme relies on artificial pumps, a fragile lifeline. But we have seen similar feats in Egypt's Tasha Lakes, which it was created artificially in the 1990s or Lake Kariba in Zambia and Zimbabwe, it's slightly smaller than the state of Delaware, and it is the biggest artificially created lake in the world. In 2023, architect firms proposed solar cities around the hypothetical sea, self-sufficient metropolises powered by renewables. Imagine Dubai-style skyscrapers rising from the outback, surrounded by algae farms producing biofuel. To succeed, engineers wouldn't just build dams, they'd erect walls against an advancing force as relentless as the colossal titan, where every blueprint is a battle cry. But let's get real. Current tech isn't there yet. Breakthroughs like graphene filters, which could desalinate water 100 times cheaper, or salt mining the sea's salt for export even with these, the project remains a Hail Mary. The biggest hurdle isn't engineering, it's ethics. The Arabana people call Lake Air Kadi Tanda, a sacred site. Flooding it risks erasure of culture and songlines older than the pyramids. As Elder Aaron Stewart stated, Our stories are written in this land. You can't drown them. Economically, the sea might never pay off. 
The region is stricken with poverty, especially the aboriginal poverty. It's like ordering smashed avo at a cafe while your mate can't afford toast. Australia's mining boom made it rich without mega engineering. Why gamble on a sea? Australia's inland sea is a Rorschach test of ambition. To some, it's a climate solution, to others, a colonialist fantasy. Yet the idea persists because it speaks to humanity's oldest urge to conquer nature. Will it ever happen? Probably not. But as droughts worsen, don't be surprised if the debate resurfaces. After all, Australia loves an underdog story, and what's more underdog than a desert fighting an ocean? Also, Australia sucks at fighting the nature. Just look at the emu war where Australia famously lost. So what do you think? Should Australia gamble billions on a man-made sea or invest those resources in many small, smart water solutions instead? This video took over 80 hours of research, including reviewing engineering documents most people never see. If you found it valuable, please hit the like button. Also, here's my question for you. Which of these other impossible mega projects should I cover next? I will put options in the Patreon and in the YouTube membership tabs. You can vote and also input your own topics. If it's selected, I will do a video on your topic. Thanks for watching, subscribe, stay curious, and reasonable.